Hey, welcome back to our study on the incarnation, the study of God becoming human. So if God became human, we need to know what is a human? Are we just a chunk of matter? Are we just a physical body, the thing we see? Or is there something hidden, something immaterial, like a soul or a spirit? For most of human history, humans have believed that there is actually more going on than what we see that our consciousness, our mind, our life must emerge from something immaterial, like spirit or soul. Now, I prefer the word spirit, although in the literature, when you study the incarnation, you're going to see the word soul more than spirit. Now, the word is used interchangeably. But as we go through this lesson, you're going to see why I prefer to use the word spirit. So, human creatures are a body-spirit composite. All right, we're not just a chunk of meat, a chunk of matter. All right, there's more going on than meets the eye. Now, we know that when God created Adam, the first Adam, he took the dust of the earth or the elements that are found on our planet and he formed his flesh body. And if you see that pie chart, you'll notice that we're made up of oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen, and nitrogen, and a bunch of different elements. So God collected all of these atoms to form Adam's physical body. He formed his flesh from these elements. But it was inanimate. It, it was just a chunk of matter. It had no life in it until God breathed the breath of life into that man's nostrils. Then he became a living creature. So that lifeless body was just a corpse, basically, until God breathed life into it. Now, see, when God breathes, he doesn't just move air molecules, like, oh, smell my breath. No, when God breathes, he releases spirit life, spirit energy. Like when Jesus breathed on his disciples, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. So God exhales life. He is life. Okay? So when God created Adam, he just formed his body from the elements that we find on our planet. Then he breathed into it, gave him consciousness. He was able to move around and think, and he had life. He was a living creature, but not until he had a spirit. And that's the important part. So the breath of God in this context, in the book of Genesis, is the animating life force that God gives to all living creatures. Okay, not just human beings, but even animals have the breath of life. Now, the Hebrew word that's used for breath is nashima, and it means puff of wind, vital breath, divine inspiration, intellect, inspiration, soul, spirit. So this breath was the animating life force put in all living creatures. So let's look at Genesis 6 real quick. God has decided that he's going to destroy the planet. He's tired of all the sin. He's going to send a flood. And notice what he says in Genesis 6.3. My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. So we see here that there are two parts to the human creature, spirit and flesh. And where is the spirit? It's in us. All right, our spirit is in us. And then he goes on in verse 17, For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. So see, there you go. Animals and humans have the breath of life. Everything has a spirit. If it didn't have a spirit, it wouldn't be alive and conscious. That's the very thing that gives us consciousness, as we're going to see here. Now, the human creature is a very unique creation of God. We are created in the image and likeness of God. Angels are not created in the image and likeness of God. Animals are not created in the image and likeness of God. Only humans are created in the image and likeness of God. As a matter of fact, God made us so much like him that he could actually become one of us and not lose his divinity. That's essentially what happened in the incarnation. See, humans were created to contain the glory of God, not just reflect it. Angels reflect God's glory. See, they're in God's presence. You know, and when they come and they visit the earth after being in God's glory, they emit light. Just like Moses, when he went up on the mountain in the book of Exodus, 
He was in God's glory for 40 days. And he came down from the mountain and he had to cover his face because he was shining. There was glory coming out of his skin. Okay, but Moses wasn't born again. He didn't have glory coming out of his spirit. It was coming out of his skin. But humans were created to contain the glory of God, the spirit of glory in our being. We were created to be mobile temples that house the glory of God's presence. Okay, our humanity is where God's divinity fits. Now, this is going to blow your mind what I'm about to say, but it's very true. God created Adam, the first Adam, in such a way that he could actually become one. And that's what Jesus was. He was the last Adam. So the only way the incarnation can work is if the human creature was designed in such a way that it could contain that glory. Because the other beings cannot contain that glory. But you can, I can, because we're created like our Father. So the spirit of humankind, or the part that God breathed into Adam to animate his body and give him consciousness, is what the Apostle Paul calls the inner being. And the inner being is the part of us that God's divinity fits into, and the reason why the divine Logos was able to become incarnate in the first place. All right? So let's go through some scriptures and let's document the fact that the human creature actually does have a spiritual component. And let's start in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? Father of spirits. Now, are we talking about angels here? Because we know that angels are spirits. Well, no, if you go down to verse 22 and 23 of this same chapter, look at what they write. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So do you see that? The spirits of the righteous made perfect. We're talking here about Christians who have died and they've gone to heaven. They're called spirits. Do you want to know why? Because they are spirits. We are spiritual beings. And doesn't that make sense? If God is spirit, as Jesus taught us in John chapter 4, that we would be spirits. Now, the only difference is we have a physical body. God doesn't have a physical body. But He is spirit. He created us with a spirit, so we're like kind. All right, so let's look at another verse of Scripture, Zechariah 12, 1. Thus declares the Lord, who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. So our spirit is within us. But notice that the text says that God forms the spirit within us. This is one reason why I do not believe in the Traducian view that parents pass their soul or spirit onto their children. No, God creates a unique soul at each conception because that soul is the person. It is a unique person. So we don't get our soul from our parents. God creates it. So in that sense, I believe in the creationist view, not the Traducian view. All right? Now, let's look at another verse of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. I don't want you to miss this. We have clear scriptural teaching that the person, the real you, is a spirit. It's the hidden person of the heart, as Peter calls it. And it's in us, all right? That's our intellect. That's where our will, that's where our mind is. It originates in our spirit man. All right, so your person is not what you see. Your person is inside you, wearing a body. And this is why Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, I think it right as long as I am in this body. Did you notice how Peter worded that? I, the person, is in 
a body. So he goes on, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. So Peter says, I, his person, would soon leave his body. So when we are in our bodies, we're alive. When we put off our bodies, we die. So you, me, we are in a body. And that part of us that is in the body is our spirit man, our inner man, the inner being, the hidden person of the heart. Now, the body is part of our being and cannot exist without our spirit, as James wrote in James 2.26. He goes, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So we see from this that the spirit of a thing is what gives it life and being. This proves that who we are as a person in possession of a nature comes from our spirit. Okay? And how do we know this? Well, when you die, if you're a Christian, you're going to go to heaven. You're going to be in a disembodied state. Well, are you going to stop being a human because you don't have a body? Are you no longer going to be able to think because you don't have a flesh brain? As if your mind depends on a brain? No, that proves right there that your consciousness must come from something that's not matter. Or else how could you exist in that disembodied state uh, between your death and the resurrection of the dead? So just think about that. Then in Matthew 27, 50, Jesus cried out again and with a loud voice yielded up his spirit. Notice it does not say soul. Although soul would be correct, but the Bible uses the word spirit more than it uses the word soul to describe that immaterial part of us. And then in Luke chapter 8, we see an example of someone being raised from the dead. They are dead, and then they're made alive. And what do you think happens that makes them come back to life? Their spirit returns. And it says, And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned. You see, there's the connection. Without a spirit, your body is dead. So not only is our spirit the animating life force or the divine spark, it's also the seat of our consciousness. It's where our mind operates. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.11. Paul wrote, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person? Ah, look at that. The spirit of the person knows your thoughts, which is in him. So the spirit of the person is in that person. And that's where your thoughts are. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So the spirit of a thing is where its mind functions. And this is how Job said it. But it is the spirit in man, the breath, the nashama of the Almighty that makes him understand. See, the spirit is where our thought process originates. If that weren't true, we would not have consciousness in heaven, in that disembodied state. I mean, nobody thinks we're just going to float around without minds, right? We're going to have full use of our mind. We're going to be able to think. We're going to know things. We're going to be able to talk. But we're not going to have a flesh brain, and we're not going to have a flesh body. No problem there. So the spirit is the seat of consciousness, but that consciousness operates through a human brain. And brains are made of flesh. They're made of matter. They're made of atoms. Okay, so think of the brain as kind of like an interface that processes information from the physical realm and the spirit realm. Okay, you receive information they're your sense gates, right? You have five senses. You can see, you can hear, you can taste, you can feel. So your outside world, how you interact with your outside world, how you take in information comes through those gates. Like if you see light, photons of light come through your eye. They hit the retina. They travel down the optic nerve to the brain. Let's say you burn your finger on a stove. Your finger touches that heat. A signal is sent all the way to your brain through your nervous system. And your brain processes that information as pain and it tells you, pull your finger away. 
So your outside world comes into your consciousness, into your mind through your sense gates. But you also have a spirit. And your spirit is your inner world. And your spirit man has been made alive by the spirit of God. And so his senses are now aware and sensitive to the things of the Spirit of God. And so you receive signals from the outside world that make it to your brain. You receive signals from your inside world by the Spirit, and they make it to your brain. So your brain, your flesh brain, is an interface that receives information from your mind and your spirit and from the outside world through your sense gates. So our bodies and our minds are very connected. And if you've ever gotten sick from being stressed out, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is why doctors are always telling people, get rest, reduce your stress, exercise, because we know that our mind and our emotional state can affect our bodies. Why? Because our bodies and our spirits are connected. Your body cannot exist without your spirit. Now your spirit, yes, can exist without your body, but your body, it just rots. It decomposes without a spirit. So they are very much connected. As the book of Proverbs says, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. So it's clear from Scripture that our inner life flows outward into the flesh, and our outer world flows inward into our spirit, into our mind. So. That's how it works. Let's say you're going to receive spiritual information from God. It comes into your spirit, man, and then it makes its way up to your brain. And then you receive knowledge. You receive wisdom. Let's say God wants to give you peace, his supernatural peace. Well, you are a physical being, and the only way you can experience emotions and feelings is by chemical processes in the brain. So what God does is he communicates to your spirit, sends a signal to your brain, and then it releases chemicals, and then you have a sense of peace or joy. So your flesh brain is an interface that simply processes information from your inner world, your spirit, and your outer world, which is the physical world. So our consciousness emerges from our spirit man, the inner being. That's what the Apostle Paul called it, the inner man, the inner being. And it is from this inner man that our nature, our mind, our will, and our intellect operate. As Paul wrote, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Now think about what he just said there. His inner being delights in the law of God. In order for his inner being to delight in anything, it has to be conscious. right? It has to have an opinion on it or to, to delight in it. So we see a connection here between the inner being or the spirit of man and the mind. So there is consciousness in our spirit. Now, Jesus understood this war between the, the spirit and the body. Remember when he was hungry in the wilderness? He fasted for 40 days. Don't you think his belly was waging war against his mind? Grumbling and growling, saying, hey, feed me. Jesus understood the battle between the flesh and the Spirit. This is why he said in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He knew all too well what it meant to go through that battle. So our spirit wants to do what's right, but our bodies of flesh are right there reminding us that it has needs and it has desires, so it wages war. Constantly telling you, hey, I need food, I need water, I need sex, I need drugs, I need this, I need that. Constantly waging war against your mind. And then Paul goes on, and it makes me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul wanted to get rid of his body. He was tired of the flesh. He wanted to live a righteous, holy life. And he was tired of his body giving him problems and being weak. And the reason our flesh is weak is because of how our brains operate, our brain chemistry. See, whenever you have a thought 
you create these little trees in your mind called dendrites. They look like little trees. They have branches. And the more you think about something, the thicker these branches become, the bigger those trees become. So if you have bad sinful thoughts, you're going to have bad sinful trees, bad thought patterns. If you have good thoughts, you're going to have good trees with good thought patterns. And this is why we can so easily get addicted to things because the more we think about something, the more your body wants it. It's easier to, to retrieve that information in your brain. Those memories are right there, ready to go because those trees, those dentrites are healthy and strong. So Paul spoke about the mind a lot in his letters. And as we're reading in this chapter, he's talking about the battle between the mind and the flesh and the spirit. And he goes on in Romans 8, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. And so there you see, when you set your mind on something, those dentrites grow. You're setting your mind on something sinful, you're going to build up strong neural pathways in your brain, and those dentrites are going to get stronger and those memories more accessible. And this will lead to patterns of behavior that are displeasing to God. The same is true if you think holy thoughts and meditate on God. Paul goes on, But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So our mind operates through a human brain, so we have a human nature. And because we are in a fallen, corrupted state, our brain chemistry is all out of whack, it's all wrong, and we have problems living in the flesh. The key, Paul is saying, is to redirect your thoughts and create good neural pathways. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. So you create good thought trees, not bad thought trees. So you see how your flesh is so important because your brain is flesh. Your brain creates chemicals and your brain can want chemicals. It can become dependent on chemicals like drugs and alcohol. So living in these flesh bodies can give us problems because of our brain chemistry. But praise God, the day is coming when we're gonna get new bodies with new brains and our brains are gonna be upgraded. They're gonna process information way quicker we're going to be able to hold way more memories. We're not going to have memory problems. We're going to be brilliant. We're going to have way more knowledge. It's going to be good stuff. Now, here's where all this is connected to the incarnation. Jesus, to be human, had to have a human inner being. He had to have a human inner man, a human spirit, just like the rest of us. He was not an avatar. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, but the main character was paralyzed and had no use of his legs. But they would attach his brain to a machine that would transfer his consciousness into the body of another species called the Navi. While his consciousness was operating through the avatar, he could run and do things his real body couldn't do. And he got to where he didn't want to go back into his real body because his real body had limitations. Well, the incarnation doesn't work this way. Unlike the movie, the second person of the Godhead, he didn't download his consciousness into a human creature. It's not like the divine person was like asleep in some chamber and he sent his consciousness down into this, this human baby. No, that's not at all what happened. No, everything that Jesus was in his pre-incarnate state, he brought to the human, Jesus of Nazareth. He became human. All of him, everything he was in that pre-existent form, he brought to the human creature called Jesus of Nazareth. As Stephen Wellam wrote, the divine person of the Son, subsisting in the divine nature, did not become a human person, but assumed a human nature. Now, did you notice what he says there? The divine Son did not become a human person. He couldn't because he was already a divine person. Such that the same I is the person of Christ that now subsists in the divine nature as God and in a human nature as a man. Through the divine nature, the person of Christ acts as God. And through his human nature, the person of Christ asserts itself within a human consciousness 
and in human language. It is the divine eye of a man who is living a genuinely human life. The subject of the incarnation is the person of the Son, the person of Christ, God the Son incarnate. And then he goes on to say, the human nature of Christ never had a separate human person. It only had its subsistence in the person of the divine Son. When the Word became flesh, He assumed a human nature that did not have a corresponding human person. The divine Son is the only self-conscious, self-asserting, active subject of Christ. From the moment of the virgin conception, the eternal Son took into His own divine person a complete set of human characteristics and components, including everything that pertains to humanity so that from then on, he is said to possess a human nature as well. So we see the divine Logos became the human Jesus of Nazareth. He didn't possess a body, he became that person. And so this is the only way that we can say Jesus is God. If the human person was not the person of the Logos, then Jesus wouldn't be God, would he? The second person of the Godhead, who is God, brought all that he was in his pre-existent form to the human egg in Mary's womb, and he became one of us. He became flesh. But it was the same person from all eternity. So these first two videos have prepared us for what's going to come next. In the next video, we're going to talk about the hypostatic union which is just a fancy theological way of talking about how the divine person could exist with both natures, both a human and divine nature. So it's going to get fascinating, so make sure you don't miss it, all right? I will see you in the next video.